Emil Hirsch is one of the most versatile and talented young actors today. You saw him in Into the Wild, directed by Sean Penn, which to me is one of my top three films of all time. I'll, I'll just say that right off the bat. Because, uh -oh. yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> But it was incredible. That and um, the fact that you could go from being Christopher McCandless to being Speed Racer mm -hmm. and then playing an activist in Milk. And now you're playing a, <laughs> that's to say, a person with a drug debt that uh, mm -hmm. was hard to pay off in the latest film by William Friedkin called Killer Joe. Yeah. Directed by a legend. I mean, this is the man who did The French <coughs> Connection, he did The Exorcist. What was it like working with William Friedkin? Well, my first experience with Friedkin was uh, they had reissued The Exorcist into the theaters in Los Angeles. So I went to, I think it was the, the Man Village in Westwood, and I saw Exorcist. And as I was watching the movie, I had this kind of tingly, needle, prickly sensation where I realized that I was having a full-blown anxiety attack, Jeez. the real kind. You know, um, and I contemplated get, and I was in the middle of the the aisle, uh -huh. so it was a far of the row. So it was a far walk to get to the aisle. So I would kind of looked, and I realized it would be very difficult at that moment to go <laughs> and escape the theater. But I'd never had a movie scare me so badly wow. before, I in in as an as an experience, and never no never before, never since. So. There was a little bit of dread to a certain extent, <laughs> and bad. then, but it was an amazing film, and the, 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 it speaks to the power of the film that it had that uh, reaction. Yeah. Me. So my first meeting with Billy was after they had sent me the script and they told me that he was directing it, mm -hmm. and it was at his house, and he lives in this kind of crazy mansion up in the hills, and he's got this office, and he and he came and kind of greeted me, and I didn't really know what he looked like or what he'd sound like or the cadence of his voice so much. Mm -hmm. And he brought me into his office, which is kind of a gothic kind of office. I would guess, coming from him. Yeah, there's something very, like, there's this twisted artwork, and it's kind of dark, and it's just stacked with books. And we had this kind of intense conversation, and he had this really direct way of talking to you with these kind of thick glasses that he was wearing and he just kind of seemed like a mad scientist <laughs> but he spoke about the film and the characters and the screenplay um, in a really just brilliant way that comes with having so many years of experience and the special touch that he does um, I immediately knew you know that I was in the hands of a master uh -huh. and that it would be incredible opportunity to get to be a part of the film but th some of the things that he was looking for you know was just spontaneity mm -hmm. and especially because it the source material was a play yeah you know he really wanted it to feel um, not rehearsed mm -hmm. not please what would the word be yeah scripted stalted or yeah, something yeah. the word yeah, but the character you play, I mean, you get you got the crap beaten out of you yeah. many times. I mean, you're a guy that, that got a drug problem, and then you He's a bit of a human punching bag towards the end I was going to say, yeah. I mean, have you ever been in a movie where you got beaten up that bad before? Because that was some serious butt kicking. Well, I mean, you can't get beat up much worse than death. <laughs> That's what I was I mean, <laughs> Yeah, well. Um, but... Uh, it was, it's, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon when you watch yourself be beaten up that badly, yeah. you're, you know, mm -hmm. get your ass kicked so thoroughly. Yeah. The first time I saw it, I don't know why, but it elicited like spontaneous laughter from me, involuntary laughter, hard, any... hard laughter, where I completely lost it. Now this is when you were watching the uh, the finished product. And yeah, you're... Billy brought me into the editing room and uh -huh. sat me down and, and showed me, and from the beat down uh -huh. with the bikers through the whole ending. Yeah, I for some reason even at all the worst parts I just couldn't stop laughing, and I I, I never knew if that was kind of this weird 
like pushing some weird button in my brain of just seeing yourself being beaten that you, like I'd never seen before and like yeah. you know if it was like some I don't know like cynical self punishment gratification kind of thing I, I couldn't tell exactly what it was but for whatever reason I started laughing kind of like an out of body experience almost like it that. was it was very strange you yeah. know it was like it's it's a strange thing to see mm hmm well, part of the reason why you were being beaten up is because you hired Matthew McConaughey to kill your mom. I mean, how? what do you draw on to, to come McConaughey. up with a guy that wants Joe to... Joe Cooper. Well, Joe, yes, killer Joe Cooper. But, but I mean, how, how do you come up with a persona that wants to kill his own mother? I mean, wh where did you go for that? Well, he has to start out hating his mother. Well, there's that. <laughs> you know, uh, but I think the, you know, his mother... To, it sounds bad to me and you, but in this guy's case, you know, his mom, he probably really didn't like her very right. much. Yeah, there is know? that. So pretend like she's not your mom and pretend she's your mm -hmm. arch enemy for a second. And I think mm -hmm. that that's probably a little closer to the way he viewed things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he just wanted her... To, I, I don't know. I mean, that's one of the stretches uh, of the imagination that acting requires. Is, I don't know. I could never imagine that. This is the worst thing imaginable. Yeah, as well, you probably have a good relationship with your own parents, right? Great. Yeah. But, you know, you, you got to kind of throw that out the window and just... You don't necessarily have to completely understand mm -hmm. as long as you can say the lines and, mm -hmm. and play the scene. I don't, I don't necessarily think an actor has to understand the character they're playing. I think that that's to a certain degree, um, and not always applicable, but there yeah. there is a, a large amount of bullshit. <laughs> yeah. You know, actors kind of can wind themselves up and convince themselves of, but mm -hmm. a lot of the times when people do things, they don't understand the reasons why they're doing them. Mm -hmm. um, so why the hell would an actor who's pretending to be them? Yeah. So, uh, you know. Well, in the case of playing Christopher McCandless in Into the Wild, I totally bought that you were Alexander Supertramp. I mean, that you had totally chucked everything that, that you'd built up, you know, in terms of your schooling and your relationship with your family and your parents, and you just wanted to go for it and, mm -hmm. you know, travel across the country and go up to Alaska and try living in the wild. I mean, there would seem to be no line between who is Emil Hirsch and, and who is a, an actual person, Christopher McCandless, who ended up dying in Alaska. Mm -hmm. Did you do anything in particular to prepare for that role, like reading the book? By uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, the the preparation for that was fairly specific in the sense yeah. it was it was really kind of uh, reading the books that McCandless would be have read and yeah. exposed himself to, and there was also a limited amount of a videotape of him right. in college, but it was performing a skit and talking to people that had known him and stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I don't necessarily... I think that the 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 books and that, like, Ralph Waldo Emerson and Thoreau and some yeah. of those writers, I think that that helped get into the mindset of mm -hmm. what would have motivated McCandless. Yeah. What could have partially motivated him to do that, mm -hmm. to did, go off into the wild. Did you read the book by Krakauer? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I loved the book by Krakauer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, mean, I read the book before I read the script. Okay. Yeah. And that's what made you decide to do it? Um, well, no. I mean, I decided to do it as soon as Sean called me. <laughs> I believe that. Yeah. Yeah, any excuse but, to work with Sean Penn. Yeah, I mean, plus I was 21 at the time. Mm -hmm. um, it's been six years. I'm 27 now. Crazy. So I was just mm -hmm. like, Sean Penn? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah. It seemed like that process turned you into a bit of an activist because you, you climbed Kilimanjaro, you know, the, the summit for the summit. and you spent well, the, some time way, the way that worked was just my friend Kenna, who's a musician, he was gathering a group of actors and musicians and stuff to go climb up Kilimanjaro for, for clean water. Mm -hmm. And it was going to be, an, it, it, they made it an MTV documentary that was geared to raise awareness and raise money. Right. And so we climbed Kilimanjaro, we had a whole video crew, and mm -hmm. I had a great time on it. I, I got a little sick, but it was okay. Altitude sickness? Or it was just like kind of just crazy, unsanitary living. You yeah. Know? Just kind of got a little infected, but it, mm -hmm. they, they pumped me full of some um, antibiotics, and I limped up to the top. Mm -hmm. 
And then the times that I had gone to um, the Congo, I went yeah. to the Congo and Zimbabwe. Yeah. On two separate trips with Oxfam mm -hmm. America. Well, the Congo's <coughs> intense. I mean, anyone who would go there, I mean, man, you don't know what you're going to The Congo is actually a bit of a, uh, a funny little story because I had planned on going to the Congo. Oxfam had invited me, and I got to know Oxfam America, their Oxford Famine. They're based in England, but they yeah. branched out across the world. Uh -huh. So after Into the Wild, where McCandless had given his life savings to Oxfam, mm -hmm. they invited me on this trip mm -hmm. to Congo, of all places. Right. And I'd read the Michael Crichton novel. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, geez. Um, I, didn't, I didn't know what to expect, but it was supposed to be with a few other actors. But they all mm -hmm. canceled. One of them a couple weeks before, and one of them on the way to the airport, I got the call which told me that this actor had decided not to go. Yeah. So I thought, well, I'll just go anyway. Mm -hmm. I'll be the only actor. It's not like I'm going alone. There's still other people with Oxfam. Yeah. And so we went and we explored the on-the-ground on operations. They build wells. They call them boreholes. Yeah. These big kind of metal screws in the sky. Mm -hmm. and they, these little irrigation systems and sanitation systems. They, they, they really do do a lot, and it doesn't take much of that type of kind of... Some of the technology is relatively simple, mm -hmm. especially to clean water. You yeah. can clean water. There's a lot of really brilliant methods to, to clean dirty water. Mm -hmm. But it was able to, to see that, and you, know, you might wonder, well, why would an organization like Oxfam give a shit about an actor going to somewhere? But the truth about it is is that you know, they, they want people like me or other people with any kind of public profile to go yeah. and then talk about it. And yeah. Because most people don't really know what it is. Right. And, you know, you don't usually want to listen to some nerdy, nutty professor mm -hmm. talking about oh, totally. stuff like that. How do you think the trip changed you? I don't know. Yeah. I've, I've been to Africa several times with World Vision and done similar things and saw the building of wells and that sort of thing. And we sponsor thousands of kids who were there through my radio program.